Hey everybody, in this video, what I want to talk about is Han Feitze and Niccolo Machiavelli and their positions on order and society. So let's go ahead and dive right into the text of Han Feitze. We'll start by taking a look at Han Feitze here. Now this is in the selection, this is page 307 out of the first edition of classical Chinese philosophy. And in the work the Han Feitze. This is chapter 7. So again, much like we've seen with Mozze, um, you know, the, to the totality of the works are often called the Mozze for the book. It matches the author. So this is in the Han Feitze. And this is chapter 7, the two handles. And we're going to comport this with Machiavelli. Now, um, I'll say more about Machiavelli in a little bit, but Machiavelli is not a classical thinker because he will be the latest thinker in time that we've encountered. So when we were dealing with uh, even Thomas Aquinas, we're, we're talking about the medieval period, and here with Machiavelli, um, you could say the Renaissance to potentially the early, early modern periods. But there's still a sense in which he's influenced by classical Western thinking, so I think he fits into the classical tradition, even if his thought is a much more recent development. He's definitely saturated with that kind of classical thinking, even though he reaches some conclusions uh, that would put him, I think, into conflict with Thomas. But let's start here with Han Feitze. And what we'll see here is Han, Fe, or Han Feitze, very different outlook from what we've seen so far, comparing him to either, is it really anyone, Kangse, Zhongse, Laozi, Mozi, <laughs> very different view. And in fact, sometimes this view is called legalism. So, as soon as we say legalism in English, I think most of the time the word legalism, what comes to mind, is probably the Christian critique in the New Testament of what was apparently going on uh, with, say, the in, in within within the church in Galatia, in the book of Galatians. Uh, in the New Testament, where legalism is that one is saved or achieves salvation um, with God through a rigorous keeping of the mitzvah, of the law as prescribed in the Torah. And, and that, at least in the New Testament, it ends up being sort of Christian sects that want to hold on to a rigorous uh, application of what we'll call the law, the mitzvah, uh, the law of God as prescribed in the Torah. Um, that's obviously not the legalism in view here. But, and, and so, and obviously we're not dealing with a context of anything that has to do with the Torah. But neither does it mean any kind of salvation through a keeping of the law. That's not what it means at all. So when we talk about the legalist tradition in China, I think we can just look at Han Feitze and see what's going on here. It's that it's not so much about, sorry, order in society is not so much about a restoration of individual virtue, okay? Whether it be uh, for Kong Tzu, like looking at the Zheng Ming, looking at names practicing ritual or with Lao Tzu following the way or with Mozi and the indiscriminate love <laughs> nor with uh, Zhongzi's thinking outside the box it's definitely none of those things I think we can say that legalism is a position uh, which is a, a, an authoritarian position which is that listen if you want society to be great, it's not that you, you know, try and, you know, find out what your what your role is per se, like be a better father, be a better son, filial piety. It's not oh, look at the trees and look at the waterfalls and try and do without doing like they do. It's not love indiscriminately. Um, 
it's really people in power ought to use their power rightly and with force to get things done. It's, there's almost a kind of realpolitik here, which some, and some scholars have pointed out that this, when we read Han Feitze, who is another ancient thinker, it seems kind of like Machiavelli, who, again, for us, we're only five centuries removed from Machiavelli, but we're far removed uh, by almost millennia, uh, multiple millennia, uh, with Han Feitze. Um, and uh, even though there's a kind of continuity there, obviously there's some particular differences in their respective contexts. But what I want to do is go ahead and get right to the text. And rather than me talking about it, let's look at what's going on here and I'll unpack it. So what I'm looking at here is chapter 7, The Two Handles. And let's just, uh, I'll take a little bit and unpack it, take a little bit and unpack it. The way an enlightened ruler controls his ministers is through the use of two handles. And think of these almost as like levers. All right, there's two levers, two switches you can flip and nothing more. That's it. These two handles are punishment and favor, okay? <laughs> we might say today, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, okay? Those are, the, those are the two powers you've got as a ruler with those underneath you. And here, ministers, especially those directly under beneath you, directly beneath you. Uh, so, <laughs> very clear here. What is meant by punishment and favor? To kill or to execute. This is what is meant... Um, by punishment, to venerate or to reward. That's what's meant by favor. Okay, So, hey, you failed me, you're dead. You did a good job, hey, you're going to get a promotion. That's it. <laughs> Those are the two powers that a leader has. King, emperor, and so, or, and so on. Those who serve as ministers are fearful of execution and penalties and regard being venerated or rewarded as something beneficial. So, if the ruler of men personally exercises his power to punish and grant favors, then the assembled ministers will all fear his might and turn to the benefits he offers them. So here's already the thesis in Han Feitze. Um, you, can, you can reward and venerate, or you can kill or execute. So those who serve you poorly, they're done. Those who serve you well, rise them up. And Han Feitze really talks about real, what the rulers at the top should be doing. Okay, so whereas in, say, Kangse, we had kind of the what everybody should be doing in their respective contexts, or with Lao Tzu, it was kind of everyone can do this. Uh, and with Motsu too, to a degree, uh, to the uh, really, um, in the same way as Lao Tzu, there's kind of a universality to everybody can practice this, everybody can follow the way, everybody can love indiscriminately. This is for leaders. Now, further down the chain of command, this can, so if you're the king, you treat your ministers above you in this way. But if you're lower down the chain, if you're a baron, you treat other people this way. And you could go down even further. If you're just a father in your own household, or, or really, we can extend this um, to really any gender. You're a parent, you treat your children this way. You reward, now that doesn't mean necessarily when we're talking about a punishment that you kill, that you execute. We can talk about it in degrees, but you punish and you reward. Those are your powers as a leader to those who are under your command. Okay, are those who are in um, subservience to you. Those are your two powers that you have. Okay, and the idea is here: people will want to. People underneath you will want to be on your good side if they know this about you. And really, there's a hint that if you don't do this effectively, people who are n undeserving will take advantage of you. Han Feitze says this elsewhere. People who are undeserving will take advantage of you. People who are not really good at their jobs will kind of roll over you if you're all forgiving. And then people who are, <laughs> are good might not really do as well as they could otherwise if they don't have that kind of enforcement in place. Uh, look what he says in the next paragraph. With the corrupt ministers of the age, however, this is not the case. When they hate someone, they are able to obtain the power to punish from the ruler and accuse him. And when they love someone, they are able to obtain the power to grant favors from the ruler and reward him. Now, if the ruler of men does not make it so that the might and benefits that derive from rewards and penalties only come only from him 
and instead listens to his ministers when carrying out rewards and penalties, then the people of the state will fear their ministers while dismissing their ruler and turn to their ministers while departing from their ruler. Here's a problem. So you don't want your ministers to ultimately be the authoritative ones, or else people are going to go to the, if go to them. If if some second in command is really the one from which favor and punishment derives, then your authority at the top is meaningless. To think of a comical example, I think of the film, the Disney film Aladdin, where you know you've got the Sultan, right? You know, trying to get jasmine married but then you have who's really seems to be running the show of agrabah and it's jafar or at least until his plan is thrown out of whack okay i don't want to get into that real life examples are there times when the second command is really running the show um i think the most obvious example would be um maybe not obvious but i think of uh, in the early prussian empire or the the German Empire, which uh, was involved in World War One, that really began in the 1870s, not with the Hohenzollern um, Prussian ruler, the Kaiser, but really with his minister Otto von Bismarck. He was the one, you know, sort of running and orchestrating things, and so he's really, really the one in power. And Han Feitzi says, "You don't want that." Because if you're technically in charge, say you're technically the king or the emperor or the queen or what have you, if you're technically the one in charge, but then someone else is really running things and people know to fear them, then that's the person really in charge and you're just a figurehead and you've made yourself one because of your poor leadership. Don't do that because you just usurped yourself, all right? <laughs> so don't do that or else you end up playing yourself and doing yourself a disservice. Um, and he continues, this is the misfortune that comes when the ruler of men loses the power to punish and grant favors. The reason why the tiger can subdue the dog is because he has claws and fangs. But if the tiger loses his claws and fangs and allows the dog to use them, then the tiger will instead be subdued by the dog. Don't give away your claws and fangs. Keep those to yourself, if you're the ruler, of course. A ruler of men is someone who uses punishments and favor to control his ministers. Now, if the ruler of men loses his power to punish and grant favors and allows his ministers to use them, then the ruler will instead be controlled by his ministers. Uh-uh. That's not what you want as a ruler. Keep that power. Keep the. If you're in charge of something, keep that power to punish and to favor to yourself. If you end up delegating that power, you end up usurping yourself. And he gives an example in the next paragraph. Thus, Tian Chang requested the power to grant titles and stipends and exercise it over the assembled ministers above, while at the same time increasing the size of the bushel and pickle measures and distributing grain among the hundred surnames below. In this case, Duke Jian lost his power to grant favors and allowed Tian Cheng to use it. As a result, Duke Jian was eventually assassinated. Tzu Han said to the Lord of Song, veneration, rewards, boons, and gifts, these are the things that the people all enjoy. Let you, my lord, take care of these things yourself. Death, mutilation, punishment, and penalties, these are the things that the people all hate. Let me, your servant, take care of all these. Thereupon, the Lord of Song lost the power to punish and allowed Zihan to use it. As a result, the Lord of Song was robbed of his authority. Tian Cheng gained exclusive use of favor, and Duke Jian was assassinated. Zihan gained exclusive use of punishment, and the Lord of Song was robbed of his authority. So if those who serve as ministers in the current age are taking control of both punishments and favor, then the danger facing the rulers of the current age is far greater than that faced by Duke Jian and the Lord of Song. <laughs> Thus, whenever a ruler is robbed, killed, imprisoned, or overshadowed, it is invariably because he has endangered himself and his state by giving up control of punishments and favors and allowing his ministers to use them. So if people go against the leader, that would be the Lord of Song, Duke Tian, you're a duke, you're a lord, you're a king, you're an emperor. If people are of the mind that they can come at you, you've messed up. 
either by delegating your favor or delegating your punishment to someone else. They don't fear you. Neither do they want to be rewarded by you because really they know it's not really about you. It's about someone else. And so, and notice here he says this is the cause here. If someone goes out, if, a, if someone's assassinated in high up leadership, it's because people think they can come at them. They don't really fear it. They should. Or maybe they could be prevented from even trying to do something like that, not because they fear, but because they want your approval. They want your approbation. They want you to reward them for their good job that they've done. If a ruler of men wants to put an end to vice, and now this is a huge question in Chinese philosophy. We want to get rid of you know bad things going on in the world. For Kongzi, it's go and get ritual right. Okay, humaneness, Jin, go back to that. Okay, for Mozi, it's love indiscriminately. For uh, Lao Tzu, it's get right with the Tao, with the way. Listen to Han Fei if a, ruler, if a ruler of men wants to put an end to vice, he must examine the correspondence between form and name, what it, what it looks like and what it's called. Okay, what something looks like and then what we call it. And look to see how what is said is different from what is done. So if there's something going on wrong, what's the thing that we want right and how is it not computing? How is the function not working? When those who serve as ministers lay out proposals, the ruler assigns them tasks based on their proposals and then uses their tasks to hold them accountable for their achievements. All right, you got an idea? Bring it to me. All right, so your job's going to be this. Do this, okay? If the achievements accord with the task and the task accords with the proposal, the minister is rewarded. Hey, you, you gave me a suggestion. I gave you a job. You completed it. Good job. Okay, I'm going to promote you. I'm gonna give you some, you're going to get paid. Right, you're going to get rewarded, you get land titles and so on. If the achievements do not accord with the task, or the task does not accord with the proposal, then the minister is penalized. Thus, if someone among the assembled ministers proposes something great, right, hey, your majesty, I've got an idea, we should do this. All right, great, I'm going to put you in charge of it. Okay. I'm going to do this great thing. It's going to make a bunch of money, and it doesn't, it doesn't follow through. Hey, we were able to do this. You're going to be punished for it. That person should be punished for it. You made big promises. You didn't follow through. In this case, one is not penalizing them because the achievement is small, but rather because the achievement does not match their named objectives. You were, had a lot of big talk. You didn't follow through. If someone among the assembled ministers proposes something small, but the achievement is great, listen to this one. If they propose something small, but the actual achievement is great, he should also be penalized. You might think, oh, that one should that person should be rewarded for overachieving. No, 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 no. In this case, it is not that one is not pleased by the great achievement, but rather that one feels that the harm that comes from achievements not according with named objectives is even greater than the benefit of the great achievement. So he must be penalized. The problem is not like let's say like listen. I'm going to do this thing. I think it's going to be small. Maybe you say something like this. You know, what? I'm going to make, I'm going to do something. It'll make us a couple of thousand dollars, and it ends up making millions of dollars. All right. <laughs> Obviously, there's no dollars in a Chinese context uh, in the ancient world. You might think, well, shouldn't that be something to be commended? No, because what the minister lacked was not being able to connect their objective to what they were actually doing. If they overachieved, it wasn't because of their leadership. It was purely accidental. In other words, a minister should know what they're doing. They should have a task, they should set it out and do it. If they're going to do more than that, they should have said, oh, they should have had the wisdom and the wherewithal to say, I'm going to accomplish this thing. I, my goal is I'm going to do this, do that goal. If you end up going past that goal, it's not something to be celebrated, it's something really to be denigrated. You, an overachievement is problematic. That, again, that might seem completely bizarre to you, but overachievement is problematic. You should have the wisdom to know if you're if you're in a position if you're in a position of subservience, set out exactly what you're going to do. Do that thing. Okay. Now I can think of maybe in a modern context, someone says, you know, hey, I'm going to work on a project this weekend, um, and then they do a lot more. Like, oh, I was able to do this. I organized all the filing cabinets, and now I got 30 hours of overtime. You know, someone in charge might go, it's really great that you did all these things for the office. 
uh, but that doesn't mean you're going to be commended for uh, overachieving when you only said you were going to do something like, you know, I was going to come in and do five hours of work, I ended up doing 70 hours of work, but look how much I accomplished. Great, that's not what you talked about. Okay, so it might end up being, it might look great, but it might end up being an expenditure. And it also means you're taking advantage of the leadership by saying, I'm going to do this thing, and you end up doing more than you said you were going to do. Not good. Aim to be precise. I, I guess you could also compare this to, you know, I say something like, mm, <laughs> write a five-page paper, and you write a 30-page paper. I'm not going to reward you a higher grade for writing a 30-page paper. All right, you might think, look at all the work that I've done. Okay, yeah, you've done a lot of work. That was not the task that you were asked to do. <laughs> All right, so he gives a couple of other ex examples here. Let's go into the next example. Marquis uh, Zhao of Han once became drunk and fell asleep. The steward of Caps, seeing that his ruler was cold, placed the Marquis's cloak over him. When Marquis Zhao awoke, he was pleased by this and asked his attendants, who covered me with the cloak? His attendants replied, it was the steward of Caps. Consequently, the ruler punished both the steward of Caps and the steward of cloaks. He punished the steward of cloaks because he felt that the man had failed to fulfill his appointed task, and he punished the steward of caps because he felt the man had overstepped the bounds of his position. It was not that the Marquis did not like, did not dislike the cold, but rather that he felt that the harm that comes from ministers encroaching on each other's offices is even greater than the harm that comes from being cold. Yes, what these people did here. All right, the person in charge of caps and cloaks. All right, they were they did something that made him comfortable, that was beneficial to him, but they overstepped their jurisdiction, their jurisdictions, their respective jurisdictions. Maybe it was a nice thing to do, and made things pleasant, but it was not in their job description. Thus, they ought not to have done it. It exceeded the bounds of what they were supposed to do. And people need to be subservient needs to be kept in check. Those who are subjects need to be confined into their particular positions. Thus, when an enlightened ruler controls his ministers, he makes it so that the ministers cannot get credit for achievements gained by overstepping the bounds of their offices, or make proposals and then fail to match them with actual achievements. If someone oversteps the boundaries of his office, he should die. If someone's proposals are not matched by actual achievements, he should be faulted. If ministers are forced to be virtuous in guarding the duties of their offices and completing the tasks they have proposed for themselves, then the assembled ministers will not be able to form cliques and factions to assist each other. Because this is what happens in politics. You don't want little team-ups happening. Well, we're on this side. We're trying to manipulate our king to do this thing. We're on this side. We're trying to manipulate the king. No, 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 no. None of that. Don't want them forming little clubs. We want this. We want that. No, 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 no. You're not this party or that party or this clique or that faction. You are the job I, the ruler, have given you. You do that. You answer to me. That's what a leader ought to do, is make sure everybody is doing their specific task, their specific job, with very specific expectations, and make sure they follow through. If they're not following through on con with concrete goals and concrete objectives, uh, monitoring uh, very fastidiously, the output, it's not going to work. Of course, what's, what's the point of all this? this? Does this seem a little cruel? Does this seem a little, you know, micromanaging? Perhaps, but the point is, Han Fancy here is looking at order. Society should be structured in this way. Now here he's just talking about the leaders at the top, the people right underneath. But this is kind of a trickle-down effect. Everybody in charge should, think, should look, at, look underneath. Make sure that those beneath you are doing their jobs. A ruler of men, he continues, faces two possible misfortunes. If he employs the worthy, the ministers will use worthiness as a pretext to rob their rulers of his power. But if he promotes men recklessly, his affairs will be neglected and he will not prevail. So here's two problems. People who are good at their jobs, if you praise them a lot, okay, you're going to be promoted. You did a great job. Then those people think, hey, I've done a great job. So I'm going to tell you, the ruler, here's what we should do. Uh-uh-uh-uh. That's one problem. Okay, you, pr you promote the worthy, and then the worthy start getting full of themselves. Oh, I'm awesome. And I've do haven't I brought you through this, 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 and the other? You owe me. The king doesn't owe you anything. 
Further, <laughs> on the other hand, the king or the ruler might be too gracious and say, listen, um, I'm going to just promote people like he's my cousin, you know, nepotism. I'm going to promote people that are related to me or because I like them or friends, uh, then expect everything uh, to go into ruin. You will not prevail. He continues, thus, if the ruler of men is fond of worthiness, the assembled ministers will dress up their behavior in order to satisfy their ruler's desires, and the true character of the assembled ministers will not be apparent. So if you're all into worthiness, everyone's going to do that thing where they pretend to be something that they're not. <laughs> you know, like if you've ever been in a job interview, what do we do in a job interview? And I think, I think we might have mentioned this example before, but think about how we present ourselves in a job interview. We don't present ourselves, we present as a version of ourselves that we want to be, you know, considered worthy. You know, think about uh, how, you know, if left unguarded, how we are. We wouldn't put ourselves like that in a job interview. We might dress a little differently. We might talk with a little bit different inflection. If you have an accent or you talk in a little bit different dialect when you're in a job interview, you all of a sudden might clean it up because you want to have a, you want to come across in a particular way. You might even use different phrasing. Okay. Depending on what it is, in the, the way you're speaking, you might in, you might engage in some code switching, and um, yeah, that's what's going to happen if you're really into worthiness. People are going to try and appear worthy, even if they're not. So be mindful of that. Uh, that's why, like it says here, thus the king of Yue was fond of bravery. So his people often looked lightly upon their own deaths. And notice the problem here. If someone says, like, I really like it when people are brave. Well, if you like when people are brave, they're going to put themselves in situations where they're thought to be brave, and that might actually be detrimental. People are like, I'm proud to die for my kingdom. Well, great. Then you have a bunch of people dying for your kingdom. Bravery is, might be great, but you don't want that. You don't want a pe bunch of people dying. <laughs> King Ling of Chu was fond of narrow wastes. So there were many starving people in his state. All right, so the king was really, really, like, people who had, you know, didn't have round bellies but skinny stomachs, so everybody's starving, trying to look, you know, fit in at the time. There are other applications of this, right? Where, you know, everybody's trying to do whatever to fit in with whatever is in at the moment, and how that ends up being a problematic listen. He continues, Duke Kuan of Qi was jealous and fond of women, so Xu Diao castrated himself in order to take control of the Duke's harem. Drastic measures. Okay. He likes women, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make myself a eunuch, so that I can be in charge of you know, basically the the manager of his women. It's pretty drastic. Duke Huan also liked exotic flavors, so Yi Ya steamed his firstborn son and presented it to him. This will be exotic for you. Okay, do um, you see this here? Going to when you have really particular proclivities people and you're in power people are going to try and do whatever they can to match those proclivities including like making you eat your own son going this is something you've never tasted before <laughs> you really like new things this is new and I, so that gets a little you know we can see they're getting a bit excessive more than a bit king kwai of yan was fond of worthiness so zi Shi made a great show of refusing to accept control of the state Thus, if the ruler reveals what he dislikes, the assembled ministers will conceal the origins of their actions. If the ruler reveals what he likes, the assembled ministers will feign abilities they do not have. In short, if the ruler reveals his desires, the true character and ambitions of his assembled ministers will be given the resources they need in order to succeed. What's the lesson here? If you're a ruler, don't reveal what you really like and what you don't real and what you don't like. Because then what will people try if people know what you really like and what you don't like, they will use that to manipulate you. So let's I mean use let's use a comical example. Let's say let's say you're a ruler and you really like the color red. Expect everyone in your court to start wearing red and bringing you red gifts. Oh, look at this red apple I found today and here's Oh, look, at, here's a, a red car that I just happened to get for you. All right, and a bunch of other red... I mean, that's the, that's the deal here, All right? To ingratiate themselves. If they know what you like, people are going to come after what you like and try and ingratiate themselves to you. To fool you. And if they, don't, if they know what you dislike, 
they're going to actively avoid those things, okay? And they'll know to do it, not because of any particular kind of wisdom, but just because they're trying to make sure they don't make you mad, okay? And fool you. Like, they find out, they're like, I'm not using the same kind of example, they find out you don't like blue, don't wear blue. They don't like it. Don't wear blue, wear red. Never wear blue, all right? I, I love blue. Maybe I wear blue when I'm at home. Okay, blue's my favorite color. I'm not going to wear it in front of my king. He doesn't like blue. They're going to use that. They're using that to fool you if you're the ruler. So in, what it should be the, is that it should be a mystery. The particular kinds of things you like and don't like, don't say it out loud. Don't reveal it. Don't make it obvious. People should wonder. All right. They should be curious. Am I doing the right thing? I don't know what the king likes. I don't know what the king dislikes. So they don't know how to manipulate you or how to fool you. That's the point that he's making here. This is the wisdom and leadership. Make your subordinates guess. Now they should know they should when you say to do something. Now when I say it, it should be a mystery. It's not that everything should be a mystery. If the king tells you to do something, you know, do that thing. But these little kinds of things to try and get like a kind of get in, and like I said, to ingratiate oneself, you shouldn't reveal that at all. The kind of stuff that you like. Oh, I love that kind of stuff. Oh, well, let me get them that. All right, for their birthday. People shouldn't know at all. All right, so let's take a look at this last paragraph here, too. Now, and that last line of, that, of this paragraph here, if a ruler reveals his desires, the true character of ambitions of assembled administers will be given the resources they need in order to succeed. This is not a good success. This is they, the ministers, will have success in doing whatever it is that they want to do against the ruler. Not good. Now, final paragraph. Thus, Zi Xie relied on worthiness to ensnare his ruler, while Xu Diao and Yi Ya used the ruler's desires to encroach upon his power. In the end, King Kuai was killed in the chaos following his abdication. And Duke Huan remained unburied until the insects devouring his corpse flowed out from under his door. That's pretty gross. What's the reason for all this? It is because these rulers of men allowed their natural dispositions to support their misfortunes brought about by their ministers. The character of ministers is not always such that they can love their ruler. Some become ministers only to increase their personal benefit. Okay, some people aren't there to serve. They're there to, you know, promote themselves. You don't want those people in power. You don't want those people in positions of, again, they're not really positions of authority, they're positions of service. You don't want people in subordinate positions that are only looking to promote themselves. You want them there to serve you, not to try and get higher up in the chain. Some become ministers only to increase their personal benefit. Now, if a ruler of men does not cover up his true character, conceal the origins of his actions, and instead allows his ministers to have the means to encroach upon their ruler, then the assembled ministers will not find it difficult to become Zi Zhi or Tian Cheng. Thus it is said, get rid of likes and dislikes, and the true character of the assembled ministers will be plain. Again, don't make, your, your, <laughs> if, you, if you'll permit me this, your turn-ons and your turn-offs entirely don't make yourself don't make those open don't make those available things that you like things that you don't like don't put that out there don't promote those things don't publicize those things keep it a mystery and if you do that the people underneath you they'll show them they'll show their true selves rather than versions of themselves that they're putting out there to try and make themselves look favorable to you the leader and when the true character of the assembled ministers is plain the ruler of men cannot be deceived because you know you're not promoting out there your proclivity you know they're, they're just coming up to you trying to do the best they can to serve that will bring the best people out All right, if you don't make it clear oh here's the kinds of things I do like here's what I do like here's what I don't like and so on but notice the position here is this this is what makes for what Han uh, Feitze is getting at here is this this is you want a good society it's not about you know oh everybody you know it's not about filial piety per se it's not about following the way. It's not about indiscriminate love for everyone. It's about the leader is in charge. And the leader 
whoever that is, the, the king, the ruler, the, the emperor, the, the, the bishop, the duke, the bear, whatever, whatever it is, you know, bishops in China, but whatever, whoever's in charge, they should be served regardless and people should not try and uh, ingratiate themselves to the ruler. They should be doing whatever the ruler says because the, the authority comes from the ruler. And, if the, if, and what's underlying all this is if people just did this rightly, this is how society would work smoothly. Everybody, the society would run smoothly. There would not be vice in the land. That's how he, um, all of this is predicated on that. You wanna get rid of vice in the land? Do this. Be a good ruler, be a strong ruler, be a ruthless one. You've got punishment and reward. Punish those who deserve it, reward those who deserve it, not the other way around. Don't punish those that don't deserve it. Don't reward those that don't deserve it. Do that, it'll trickle down. But notice here, we've got these notions of kind of the ruler should be feared. He should be, the ruler should be obeyed, <coughs> loved, might be too strong. It's not, he's not trying, you know, the, the ruler here does not want to be considered necessarily fondly by the ministers or by the subjects. It's not about love or loving kindness or compassion. It's about, I'm in charge. You obey me. You do what I say. There's that. That's not in Kongsa. Kongsa, even when we're talking about filial piety, remember when we're talking about filial piety, the son is supposed to be you know, have a reverence towards the father, but the father is supposed to be benevolent towards the children, right? This is not benevolence here, at least directly. One could argue maybe that there's a kind of benevolence to society. If, if, if this just happened everywhere in every kingdom, then it would it'd be beneficial to all of society. That's kind of what's undergirding uh, what Han Fitzi is saying here. But there's this notion of being feared and that this this system of being kind of ruthless in power uh, while being very challenging, nevertheless, it's the way to go. The ruler ought to be feared. So what I want to do now is look at Machiavelli and look at this notion of fear, fear of the ruler. Should you fear, <laughs> should the ruler be feared? Or should it be somebody like, oh, you know, I love the king. No, no, I don't know. It's not that I love the king. Like, I'm going to do what the king says because I, I don't want to get in trouble with the king. Like, I want him to reward me, but I don't want to be in trouble. Should you, should, you, should you be feared or should you be loved uh, as a ruler? And that's the question that I think Han Fetz is kind of getting at here, but we're going to take a look at Machiavelli now, and he's going to get at that same question too. Now we come to the work of Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli um, was a Florentine minister to the Medici family. Uh, and later also to the Chancery of Florence when the Medicis were out of power. Um, and I think 1469 to 1527 is when he lived, if memory serves. And what he observed um, in Italy at the time, and keep in mind, we talk about Italy. Uh, Italy in the Renaissance, really Italy until 1860, there is no Italy just like there's really not a Germany until the 1860s and 1870s um, through the works of the various uh, Prussian wars, Germany consolidates into a single country. Italy was originally, you, even in the Renaissance period, a bunch of city states um, where they maybe spoke Italian and maybe even different kinds of Italian. You have Florence, you have Milan, you have Rome, the papal states, um, and so on. And they were basically independent powers. Uh, we, we could loosely call Italy because they were on the Italian peninsula. But one strange thing that happened during Machiavelli's lifetime is that the <laughs> bastard son of Pope, I think it was Alexander VI, who was a Borgia Pope, so the Borgias being a family from Spain, Cesare Borgia was the bastard son of the Pope and um, in spite of being from a Spanish background and despite being a bastard who was at one time a cardinal in the church first person ever I think to abdicate the position of a cardinal and he basically becomes a condottieri like a, a, a mercenary military fighter but eventually, 
he actually, Cesare Borgia, ends up carving out a good chunk of Italy, the Romagna, the central part of Italy for himself, like through various military victories. Especially, I think, with respect to uh, with Milan. Uh, there's some other cities, some other cities that he conquered as well. But he, for a while there, he completely disrupted kind of the status quo in Italy by basically forming a new kingdom. It dissipated very quickly. Um, but the fact that this was possible, that someone could come in through might and military power and strength and disrupt the way things had been for centuries was remarkable. And certainly Machiavelli noted this. I think he even met him at one time. That is, he met Cesare Borgia at one time. So Cesare Borgia ends up getting mentioned a lot in his work Il Principe, or um, De Principatibus, um, in, in Latin, or Il, Il Principe in Italian, the prince. And um, he looks at Cesare Borgia as a, a kind of a model, of the, you know, this is an amazing leader. Like, it didn't last, but there's something to this. Now, some scholars have wondered, uh, if you look at the writings of Machiavelli elsewhere, outside of Il Principe, uh, it seems to be the case that he's he advocates a kind of republicanism, and in the prince he seems to you know have this you know almost strange fascination with power and um, you know the the the, fr the phrase the ends justify the means supposedly comes from the prince. It, you won't you won't find it in there. You'll find something. It kind of says something like that, but you won't find those words directly. It's kind of a misattribution to Machiavelli. But there's kind of a wonder of, in the, the work The Prince, does Machiavelli really mean this? Or is this like one long, uh, is, is he being sarcastic? Is, this, is he just trolling us? Um, scholars aren't entirely sure. But I think we can, it doesn't seem to fit in with uh, his positions and other works. But what, whatever's going on here... This has been a profound work in the Western canon. So let's take a look at chapter 17, where Machiavelli entertains this question. Chapter 17, about cruelty and compassion, and about whether it is better to be loved than feared, or the reverse. So if you're a ruler, is it better to be loved, or is it better to be feared? Which one's better? Should you be somebody that's, oh, you're... People are afraid of you, or oh, people love you and celebrate you. We saw what Hanfetti already said. People should fear you. What does Machiavelli say? Let's take a look. So again, this is chapter 17 of Il Principe. Going further down our list of qualities, I recognize every ruler should want to be thought of as compassionate and not cruel. Nevertheless, I have to warn you to be careful about being compassionate. Hanfetti already warned us about this. You shouldn't want, to, don't be too willing to distribute favor. Let people know what you like. And here comes Cesare Borgia. Cesare Borgia was thought of as cruel. But this supposed cruelty of his restored order to the Romagna united it, rendered it peaceful and law abiding. You, like, you can say whatever you want about Cesare Borgia. It turned central Italy into a little organized state there for a while. And it was united. It was peaceful. It was law-abiding. Things were good. He might have been cruel, but things were good. If you think about it, you'll realize he was, in fact, much more compassionate than the people of Florence, who, in order to avoid being thought cruel, allowed Pistoia to tear itself apart. And so a ruler ought not to mind the disgrace of being called cruel if he keeps his subjects peaceful and law-abiding. For it is more compassionate to impose harsh punishments on a few than out of excessive compassion to allow disorder to spread, which leads to murders or looting. The whole community suffers if there are riots, while to maintain order the ruler only has to execute one or two individuals. Of all rulers, he who is new to power cannot escape a reputation for cruelty, for he is surrounded by dangers. So let's talk about this already. He, first of all, he mentions Cesare Borgia. Now, he's considered cruel, but hey, things were going well under his rule. You might not like him. He might have been considered cruel. Things were peaceful. The subjects were law-abiding. And um, the people of Romagna were united, whereas before they were not. Like that, He made that happen. 
And then he says this, it's, isn't it better to punish a few than out of, notice he says out of excessive compassion, to let, well, you know, it's okay, we can, we can, we can let things happen, we'll let things slide. No, 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 no. He asks the question, which is better, to let things slide? We let things slide, we let things go, what's going to happen? There's going to be riots. There's going to be murder. There's going to be looting. You don't want that stuff to happen? Don't be too compassionate. If you're too compassionate, people don't fear you. Those are going to be the results. And he quotes Virgilius or Virgil. Harsh necessity and the fact my kingdom is new oblige me to do these things and to mass my armies on the frontiers. So he's saying for people that are new, like you got to make it known. Like when, when you first come into power, people are going to doubt you. Is this person a coward? What are they like? Show yourself strong early on. If you're a fresh ruler, you gotta show yourself to be strong. Okay? And be, because people have to know who you are. People are, when you're new to a position, people are always gonna think you're cruel whether you are or not. And he continues, and again, this is a, basically a, a litany of, of advice to a ruler. Nevertheless, you should be careful how you assess the situation and should think twice before you act. Do not be afraid of your own shadow. Employ policies, excuse me, employ policies that are moderated by prudence and sympathy. Avoid excessive self-confidence, which leads to carelessness, and avoid excessive timidity, which will make you unsupport unsupportable. So, don't look too strong. Like, you, you might want to come across as cruel, maybe, or like, uh, you know, authoritative. Don't overdo it. If you're too full of yourself, you will make mistakes and don't go oh you know don't be excessively timid oh i don't know if we can do that then people won't want to get behind you, you won't seem strong at all and then he, he then he comes to the question which is the head of the chapter this leads us to a question that is in dispute is it better to be loved than feared or vice versa my reply is one ought to be both both loved and feared Okay, so that's Machiavelli's position, at least here in Il Principe. All right, you should people should both fear you and love you. Like I, I love the I love our ruler, but I'm also kind of scared of. That's good, <laughs> but since it is difficult to accomplish both at the same time, I maintain it is much safer to be feared than loved, if you have to do without one of the two. So Machiavelli says here. Optimal scenario, people love you and people fear you. But if you have to pick one, they should fear you. Okay, why? For of men, one can in general say this. They are ungrateful, fickle, deceptive, and deceiving, avoiders of danger, eager to gain. <coughs> as long as you serve their interests, they are devoted to you. <laughs> you, you know... Oh, uh, so he's saying in, uh, in answer to the question, like, you know, if you got to go with love and fear, if you have to pick one, look, look at the way human beings are. All these things, ungrateful, fickle, deceptive, deceiving, they'll support you as long as it's good for them. They promise you their blood, their possessions, their lives, their children, as I said before. So as long as you seem to have no need of them. In other words, people will promise you the moon. If it looks like you're doing well for them, they'll say that. They'll they'll talk a lot about all the things that they will give to you, you the ruler, all the things that they'll serve you with, as long as it's looking good for them. But as soon as you need help, they turn against you. Any ruler who relies simply on the promises, on their promises, and makes no other preparations will be destroyed. You can't rely solely on the good word of other, uh, the good word of others. It won't work. People will promise a lot. Yeah, I'll totally do that. Oh, you really need help now? <sighs> Sorry, mm -mm. for you will find that those who support you, <laughs> who support you by, who do not rally to you because they admire your strength of character, nobility of soul, these are people you pay for, but they are never yours. The people that you buy. And in the end, you cannot get the benefit of your investment. Men are less nervous of offending someone who makes himself lovable 
than someone who makes himself frightening. Read that again. Men are less nervous of offending someone who makes himself lovable than someone who makes himself frightening. So if you're someone who's like, no, I want to be your friend. Like, we're good. We're cool. They're going to go, yeah, all right. Well, if I mess up, I'm not really going to worry about it too much. All right, like, they're, you're a good guy. Listen, you're a really good guy. I'm really sorry. I can't help you here. If you're the affable, lovable type, expect that to be your response when you call for help. Yeah, you know what? I really love to, and I like you, but I can't help. But if they find you frightening, on the other hand, they're not going to react in the same way. <coughs> For love attaches men by ties of obligation, which since men are wicked, they break whenever their interests are at stake. But fear restrains men because they are afraid of punishment, and this fear never leaves them. Still, a ruler should make himself feared in such a way that if he does not inspire love, at least he does not provoke hatred. So you want people, like if you can't be entirely feared and loved and you're gonna to have to go the fear route, you want people to fear you but not hate you. They want, to, you, they want, you want them to be scared of you, but you don't want them to go, well, you know what, I hate our king. All right, like he, he's terrible, he's oppressive, I don't like anything about him. You don't, you don't want that, you do want, I wanna do what he says because I don't wanna be in trouble. Optimally, you want to be. You want to go. Oh, I love my king, but I and I don't want to disappoint him. That's optimal. Second best would be, I don't. I don't want to disobey him, or I don't want to get in trouble. Worst of all is, I hate him. You you don't want that. So you got to be wise in what you do because you don't want to invoke hatred. For it is perfectly possible to be feared and not hated. You'll only be hated if you seize the property or the women of your subjects. So don't go taking a bunch of your people's stuff. You just take it like, I want you, what you have, I want it. They're gonna, your people are going to hate you if you just take it. Whenever you have to kill someone, make sure you have a suitable excuse and an obvious reason. But above all else, keep your hands off other people's property. For men are quicker to forget the death of their father than the loss of their inheritance. People really like their stuff. You can do all kinds of things, but you take their stuff, that's the worst thing that you can do. They will hate you for that. You can do all kinds of things against people. Take their stuff, or what they think is their stuff, then they'll hate you. Moreover, there are always reasons why you might want to see someone's property, and he who begins to live by plundering others will always find an excuse for seizing other people's possessions, but there are fewer reasons for killing people, and one killing need not lead to another. When a ruler is at the head of his army and has a vast number of soldiers under his command, then it is absolutely essential to be prepared to be thought cruel. Okay, when, you're in char when you're a military commander, it's essential to be thought cruel, for it's impossible to keep an army united and ready for action without acquiring a reputation for cruelty. Oh, you don't want to go into battle? That's okay. You guys can go on break. We don't really need you. Don't expect those people to go into battle. Like under in a military circumstance, there's a rigid chain of command. That's why you know, um, even in the United States today, uh, there is a complete CMJ. There's a court of military justice. If something happens, if there are, are crimes committed in the U.S. military, there is a completely separate military system of justice for dealing with crime. That's not the the same thing as our you know our, our the United States' domestic dealing with crime. There can be various critiques of that. It's fine. But, for example, a, uh, a citizen is not going to be court-martialed for not paying their taxes. They might, uh, they might have charges brought against them. They might be, you know, have penalties imposed, but they're not going to be court-martialed. Someone in the military, on the other hand, can for disobeying a direct order or something like that. Not every citizen is subject to that, so there's a completely separate court of military justice. Justice works differently in the military, and it's a little bit stricter. And Machiavelli's saying here, of course it is. <clears throat> he says this, Among the extraordinary accomplishments of Hannibal, Hannibal, of course, was the Carthaginian general who early on in Rome, in the Punic Wars, tried to invade 
the Rome from the north, coming down from the Alps with his elephants. He says this, we may note in one in particular, he commanded a vast army made up of men of very different nations of the Carthaginian Empire who are fighting far from home, yet they never mutinied. They never fell out with one another, either when things were going badly or when things were going well. Again, even going through the Alps with elephants. The only possible explanation for this is that he was known to be harsh and cruel. This together with his numerous wutu, his virtues, meant his soldiers always regarded him with admiration and fear as a general. You know, you even think of the notion of a general. You don't, th you don't think of a general as a, someone cuddly and cute. And, you know, you just give him a hug. You think of them as commanding and demanding respect and authority. Without cruelty, his other virtues would have not done the job. Even, e even if he were really good at his job of commanding and his military tactical skills, <clears throat> without that cruelty of being resilient with his own troops, I'm not talking towards the enemy, I'm talking about amongst his own troops, we're going to do this and having that kind of discipline, we're going to do this. If you don't do this, you're going to get punished for it. Without that, he would not have been a successful general, even though he does end up losing, <laughs> right? Uh, there's not a, you know, the Romans persist, persist the Carthaginians do not. Uh, nevertheless, capable commander. Uh, those who write about Hannibal without thinking things through both admire the loyalty of his troops and criticize the cruelty that was its principal cause. If you doubt my claim that his other virtues would have been insufficient, take the case of Scipio, Roman general. He was not only unique in his own day, but history does not record anyone his equal. But his army rebelled against him in Spain. The sole cause of this was his excessive leniency, which meant his soldiers had more freedom than is compatible with good military discipline. <clears throat> so Scipio was a good general too, Roman general. Good general, very capable tactical commander, not really cr the cruel type, the more lenient type. He let things slide. And because he let things slide, his soldiers mutinied because they had a greater sense of entitlement. So Machiavelli is telling us here, Hannibal, at, at least in this context, is a better general than Scipio, not because one was more tactically more capable than the other, but in terms of a leadership perspective, Hannibal is a more capable commander than Scipio because Hannibal could be more cruel than Scipio. He was less lenient, letting things go like, oh, we don't need to worry. Like you think of it like in modern military terms, we don't need to worry about inspections. We don't need to make sure, we don't need to make sure standards are, are, you know, universal. Oh, the people aren't getting up making their bunks. You know, it doesn't really matter. It's fine. That lack of discipline will lead to a sense of, uh, you know, that leniency will lead to a kind of resentment. You don't want that. Okay. Fabius Maximus criticized him, Scipio, <clears throat> for this in the Senate and accused him of corrupting the Roman armies. So, uh, <laughs> when, when Locri was destroyed by one of his commanders, he did not avenge the deaths of the inhabitants and he did not punish the of officers in subordination. He was too easygoing. He was way too forgiving, going, you know, hey, it's okay. <clears throat> this was so apparent that one of his supporters in the Senate was obliged to excuse him by saying he was no different from many other men who were better at doing their own jobs than at making other people do theirs. In course of time, had he remained in command without learning from his mistakes, this aspect of Scipio's character would have destroyed his glorious reputation, but because his authority was subordinate to that of the Senate, not only were the consequences of this defect mitigated, but it even enhanced his reputation. Main thing I want you to get out of this. All right, there's there's an aspect here where it's saying that you know because he, Roman generals before prior to Julius Caesar were subject to the Senate's authority, so there's a sense in which the Senate's kind of responsible for these things at a fundamental level. Scipio is considered, you know, too forgiving, too easygoing. Even though he's a good military commander in terms of his tactical ability, his leadership, which is a different skill, someone might be tactically capable but not capable of leading in the same way because they're too lenient. And that's what Machiavelli's saying here, that what was the problem? 
people rebelled, people mutinied against him because he was too lenient. Now you might think of examples where people mutiny because someone's too cruel. Like I can think of the uh, the mutiny on the bounty and Captain Bly, Captain Bly. Captain Bly is so strict that his that his crew mutinies. Uh, you can make it that way you will. Uh, but I'll say this: even in the case of Captain Bly, when there was a mutiny, those of his crew that did go with him back to England. He, Captain Bly lost no one on the trip back of the people that were loyal to him. They had to go in a couple of boats back home. He lost no one. Okay, because of his discipline, at least for the people that didn't mutiny. Um, not Mr. Christian. So he says this, I conclude then that as far as being feared and loved is concerned, since men decide for themselves whom they love, and rulers decide whom they fear. A wise ruler should rely on the emotion he can control, not on the one he cannot. But he must take care to avoid being hated, as I've said. So again, three emotions in play here. Love, fear, hatred. Love is best. Love and fear together are actually best. If you can get your people to love you and also fear you, great. But if you have to pick between the two, go with fear and not with love. If you want people to be a little bit afraid of you, if you're a ruler, rather than love you. Again, both is best. But if you have to pick one, go with fear. But don't go out of your way to make people hate you. So that's like... Uh, <laughs> pop culture reference I think of like say Joffrey on Game of Thrones hated no one's gonna do at the end of the day what you want them to do people everyone's gonna hate you love and fear okay all right if you have to pick one fear is the way to go if you have to pick between the two is this easy no but think how this syncs up also with what Han Fadesy was saying <clears throat> There should be, society should be ruled by a kind of fear. People should be afraid. And think about this. We haven't really talked about um, Semitic literature on this point, but think about like in the Hebrew Bible, every time an angel shows up, what's the first thing they say? Do not be afraid. Because people's apparent reaction would be fear. Um, but at the same time, you know, what are you supposed to do to the Hebrew God? Fear the Lord. Fear God. Now that word fear there gets played around with. Fear means a, sort of, a certain kind of respect and reference. Reverence. So I think we need to keep that in mind. There, there's a sense of being afraid um, in, a, in a classical sense, which doesn't mean just scared. Okay, like your feet are shaking. But fear in the sense of both not wanting to disappoint, but also not wanting to incur the wrath of. And doing everything you can not to incur wrath. Okay, that's different from being terrified. It, it, it's fear, not terror. Because terror, it seems, would invoke a kind of hatred. If someone is terrified of you, they're not going to do what you say. They're going to be too terrified. Okay, but so fear involves a kind of reverence... Maybe a little, maybe a little trepidation, but not terror. Okay, so when we look at society, um, when we're looking at these two thinkers, I want us really to think about this as well. How much does fear come into play? Should we fear the state? Should we fear the government? Should we fear our rulers? Now, again, fear can mean a kind of respect. But it can also mean also that kind of fear, like I'm, I'm afraid they're going to harm me. And in fact, I think a lot of um, democratic resistance comes from fear from harm. That seems to me like a lot like hatred. So I don't think that's what Machiavelli has in view here, actually, even in The Prince. And even Han Feitze. I don't think Han Feitze would, would talk about hate. I don't think he would want 
people beneath you to hate you because then the people that hate you are going to try and kill you. You don't want to get that. You don't want people to try and kill you. You want people to obey you. So this means that leadership is a very... Uh, it's a craft that involves a lot of artfulness and a lot of wisdom. You know, those two levers of the two handles of Han Feitzi and then the wisdom of Machiavelli here. You have to rule people, and you might have to be cruel. Don't overdo it. You overdo it, you've already lost. Your people are going to kill you. So rule with wisdom, and I think that's actually the focus here, is that um, really this is the kind of wisdom that rulership involves, whether it be in ancient China or in Renaissance Italy. Uh, I guess the question persists. What does that mean for us today? And I'll leave, leave that to you to think about. Bye-bye, everybody.